whenever you're ready. Okay. Do you have that paper that came on okay. to Gladys the uh, about the history, yes. early history? Yeah, I yeah. do. I don't yeah, know. You could just give that to me. Yeah, she's seen it before, oh, she's, too. I'll yeah. ask you about the Farm Bureau. I want to talk about Farm oh. Bureau and how farms are changing. And you don't want to talk about that? Farm Bureau is nothing but an insurance company. That's true. And, okay, and, a, and a political, yeah. uh, political organization. And a, okay, we yeah. won't talk about them. What I don't, about the, uh, I don't uh, know what to say about them. Uh, the USDA, you were like Farmer of the Year once. Were you ever Farmer of the Year? No. Uh, well, I was. I was with the uh, that at that time at ASCS, uh, yeah. the County Committee. Yeah. I was okay. on that. Uh, well, good afternoon. I'm glad that you all could be here to talk about uh, Pflugerville over the last 50 years. Uh, it's the uh, birthday of Pflugerville from 1965. So tell us your name and where you were born. I'm Susan Mullenberg. I was born in Austin and uh, in a long time ago. <laughs> but mm -hmm. my parents lived in Pflugerville, so I'm native Pflugervillean. And your name? Uh, Don Weiss. I lived out here east of Fleurville for the last 77 years. On Weiss Lane? Yes. Okay. So uh, what were you doing in 1965? Well, I was a freshman in high school in 1965 here at in Fleurville, uh, playing basketball or trying to play basketball on the high school girls team. And that was one of my main uh, function or interests at the time I was in the band. Um, yeah, I guess that was shortly after the Beatles came around and that was all a hot item for us young girls at that time. But um, other than that, I, I was just interested in what revolved around me and my school friends. And what were you doing in 1965? <coughs> uh, I was farming at that time. How many acres were you farming at that time? Oh, probably five or six hundred. Okay. And what kind of crops did you plant? Well, cotton and milo. Okay. All right. So what was your role in the community here in Pflugerville? At that time? Oh, no, or now. Now, now um, I still work in Pflugerville. I do not live here anymore, but I come to Pflugerville almost uh, every weekday and on the weekends too to go to church. Uh, I work for German American Farm Mutual, which uh, was a mutual insurance company started by a group of uh, Travis and Williamson County farmers in 1891 uh, to help protect each other in case of fire or severe storm damage to their home. And I've been doing that since 1990. So now the company's uh, 124 years old. We'll be ce celebrating our 125th um, year next year. And it is the uh, oldest business in Pflugerville uh, that has <laughs> survived and is still doing quite well. Um, so dealing with uh, natural disasters or fire, uh, tell us, uh, over the years that you've actually been working with them, what, what were some of the disasters that may have happened? Uh, what, what were some of your biggest claims? Well, um, actually, in the actual Pflugerville area, we've been pretty fortunate. Uh, we write in Travis and the surrounding counties, and it, we've had um, some hailstorms. We've had some fires, larger fires, but none actually th they're in the city or right adjacent to Pflugerville. We've been pretty fortunate as far as that's concerned. We have a lot of uh, our bigger fire claims have all been out in Williamson County. Okay. And um, there's been... Yeah, we've uh, got a lot of business in Taylor. We had a, an Asian tailor that sold probably more policies than anybody else. So we, we insure, we probably got half a tailor insured. Uh, tell me how a mutual company, what does that mean to be a mutual company and how does it operate? Well, a mutual company, uh, there are, there's no owner of the company. It's like a co-op. 
and everybody that has insurance is a part owner of the company. So um, while there's, do, there's uh, premiums and everything are paid, while we're really a not-for-profit insurance company, any, any profit we make just goes into strengthen the company. Uh, we could pay dividends if we ever find the company base is large enough or strong enough to pay dividends like a, a co-op would, mm -hmm. but we never have. Mm -hmm. We also have some unique, um, we work under a different part of the insurance code than the standard insurance companies where there's owners. And um, as that, we could assess our insureds, we usually call our insureds members instead of clients or homeowners. Yeah, we started out with a, uh, the, they call them assessments. You didn't pay a premium. The, the officers, if they needed money to pay a loss, they declared an assessment and every member got an assessment for so much depending on that, some, some rate on their value of their stuff and and they paid, they, we didn't operate with a big bunch of money on hand. It was a, on demand. When you had a loss, they sent out assessment and collected the money and paid the man off. Yeah. And when I started about 23 years ago, we still called our premiums assessments. But shortly after that, they got changed into being called premiums. And... Uh, as that you could, you know, if we had a severe incident, in theory, we could still assess everyone who has members to help pay for that. But you know, we know, yeah. About your the disaster, we've been really lucky. We have not had one tremendous disaster come through our area here to cause us a big problem. Uh, tell me in the company how has uh, the technology has changed and the method of sending out the bills, how has that evolved? Totally, it evolved from uh, shortly after I started, actually when I started, we still prepared the billings for our appraisers, or they would be called agents now, and distributed them to them to mail and collect the money and then turn in their deposit slips to us in the office, to me in the office. And uh, we did that for a few years after that and then for various reasons, we went to direct billing from the office and people paying their premium to the office. And uh, by the same token, part of that was technology, part of it was just um, to keep track of things better, to get premiums in more timely, um, also to meet changing demands from the insurance code in the Texas Department of Insurance. From the way we operated and were allowed to operate 20 plus years ago to the way the restrictions and rules and governing authority over us now is a huge difference. So yeah. we have to, um, we have a ton more reports that have to be filed constantly with the Department of Insurance for different things and Farm mutuals don't have the freedom to operate like they used to. So we're not under the total control of a standard company, but it's very similar. It's getting more similar every year. Yeah, when I started out, I, they, the secretary would send me a list of my members and how much they owed and a stack of postcards. And I've copied that off of that list and onto a postcard and mailed it to them, and they mailed me a check, and then I'd bring it, turn it in when I collected it. And that means a postcard without a return envelope. Right. It was a, <laughs> the, the, yes. cheapest, a the cheapest little right. card you could buy. He bought them from a post office, and, and we, we filled them out and mailed them out. That's how we did it. Don was the appraiser for the Pflugerville district. And before him, he took over from my dad, from yeah. Leon Pfluger. 
And I actually helped my dad send some of those mailings out a few times before I was ever involved with the company. I knew about German American because... Yeah, I got involved because her dad wanted to quit. And he came out there one day to my house and talked me into taking that job. <laughs> what year was that? I don't know. <laughs> But it had to have been uh, in the it was, uh, 60s or 70s, it, probably. Yes, probably the oh, early wow. 70s, maybe, or late 60s. It was a long time ago. <laughs> I think we have it in our, um, in our minute book somewhere, it'll say. But uh, whenever someone who's been affiliated with the company a long time retires, then I research that. <laughs> <laughs> and so we can... And give that data at our annual meeting where we recognize them for their years of service. And since Don hasn't quit yet, we, I haven't, <laughs> oh, no. I don't have all those and answers. See, we're talking about my district, which was the Fluger, called Fluggerville District. And before Leon, F.J. Bowles was the appraiser for as long as I ever know. So how many districts, it was Pflugerville and you mentioned Taylor, what other communities are there? Well, there, there was Byersville. How, just how many? Were, well, there were, when I started, yeah, one. something, 14 or 15. And a couple of them had been combined by the time. There was one called Pilot Knob, so it was out kind of south mm -hmm. of Austin. There was one Del Valley. We had, at one time, Des, there was one for Dessau. But then that had, by the time I started, it had com been combined with the Byersville and Copeland area. Woodrick Hill, yeah. New Bern, Maynard. Like say, now I think we only got, what, three left? We got four. Four, four with captive agents. We, four. four. The rest of it's become The rest of business. it has all been con consolidated into the office. Mm -hmm. Susan takes care of it. So the, the first people who organized this company it was again for their protection that they wouldn't wiped out, be wiped out. But it was founded in Flickerville. So who were some of those key uh, names or people that? Right. that the story I was mm -hmm. told is that they mm -hmm. met under a tree, and I'm guessing up near the Schutz and Kegelful Rhine or somewhere. <laughs> and uh, it was um, some mm -hmm. of the key people. It was uh, Ferdinand Meyer, George Kimple, Peter Flugger, Henry Flugger, Ernst Flugger, Matthias Wittrich. Fritz Sokowitz. They were the first officers and directors. And I was kind of interested in that and I did a little work this morning on the, with the Flugger history book since there were three Fluggers on there looking to see what age because I, you know, and as you had pointed out, you know, my grandfather was kind of one of the town characters, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered why his dad or him or one of his brothers wasn't on there by some chance. And so I looked, and interestingly enough, in 1891, my grandfather was just 14 years old. So I thought, well, that answers why he wasn't involved, <laughs> although I'm sure 14-year-old young men back then were doing a full day's work mm -hmm. in the field with their fathers. But, um, but the, it's interesting that three of the uh, original um, directors in our were, settlers. were, were Pflugerville settlers and Pflugers. And the uh, George Kimple, um, I'm not sure how who he was. There is a George Kimple in the Flugger book, but he was just a, a few years old when this, so it must have been his daddy or something that married a Flugger, one of George Flugger's mm -hmm. daughters. Okay. So that must have been a younger Flugger, but that was kind of interesting to me to um, try to, I was trying to place, I don't remember any of those gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Y'all might remember them, I don't know, but... Um, well, I know Matthias Switrick came from Switzerland. Okay. And he settled here in Pflugerville. In fact, the Wittrick edition was the first uh, addition to George Pflugers' plat. Plat, okay. And he bought his farm because he wanted his family to be near Emanuel Lutheran Church. He did not want them way out in, okay. in the area. He wanted to be close to the church. Okay. Yeah, see, that's where that you're talking about when they first came, so they built these little houses and they wanted a little protection, and that's how this got organized, you know, to uh, the people that owned a house and needed a little insurance, formed this little group to provide them some protection. And, I, and like I said, it was just by word of mouth from the guy that was president when I started, Reuben Krieg, he said that 
he was always told that they wanted, he wanted to keep the, when we were looking for an office what, before, previous to me, um, every, whoever was the secretary or treasurer of the company did the business out of their home. And uh, previous to my taking, and I did it out of my home for a short while, but um, that he wanted to keep the, us to rent or have an office in Pflugerville because that's where this group of men met to make their first discussions. I can't tell you if that's really true or not, but sounds good. It sounds good, it sounds good. Uh, one of the things that was important, uh, again, in that period of time in the 1890s, when they were able to build their big barns, mm. their barns were sometimes as big and more valuable than their homes because their whole livelihood was in that barn, and mm -hmm. I think they could uh, insure their barns, and that was, that was very critical <coughs> for them. I'm sure it was. So do y'all also insure uh, like e equipment or farm equipment if they had a, a tractor or equipment? Yes, we do now and it have since I've been around and I don't know when that started, if that was from the get-go. Well, we don't have really... It probably, that's one of them deals that started like this. It, there were no tractors at that time when they started. They were, uh, we, we insured feed. Well, I think we always probably insured feed because they had to feed the horses or mules. Mm -hmm. And then, well, the tractors didn't come till about the 30s or, or so, so there was no, no demand for no insurance for that kind of stuff. Until later, I guess, yeah. So as a farmer, what was the first tractor you remember? Oh, well, those old farm all Everybody had an old Farmall F20. Uh, Did it have iron wheels or rubber wheels? They, most of them came with iron wheels. And they, uh, and then the guys at the welding shop would cut those spokes and you could buy a rim and they'd weld a rim on there and put rubber tires on them. So they had the iron wheels there weren't paved roads at the time. Why were there iron wheels instead of rubber wheels? I guess there just there wasn't no rubber tires. So okay. You couldn't get a tire like that, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> and how many, uh, how wide was it? Was it a two row or a four row or? Uh, oh, most all of that stuff was, you know, they had been using mules with one row well, when you come along and bought a, got a tractor and it took two rows, you you doubled your prote uh, production. That was a increase, wasn't it? <laughs> in increase. Well, then there there was no four row stuff at first, but then you know has has gone. Now it's uh, now they got twenty four row. So when you were a young boy, do you remember your dad or yourself? Uh, going to the field with the mules or the horses? Yeah, we we didn't have, well, Dad had that tractor, but uh, the, they didn't uh, didn't have no implements for it. He he took the, the old, like the planter and cultivator and stuff that mules pulled, cut the tongue off and put a little old short tongue with a pin, tied it behind the tractor and pulled it Instead of pulling it with mules, he pulled it with the tractor. So the farmer was uh, very creative and innovative to make things work, uh, nearly to build yeah. their own things. Yeah. And they would be welders and they would be fence builders and... Well, that first stuff, like I say, it wasn't much. You just cut the tongue off and <laughs> made a short tongue and put a pin in the drawbar and it, you did away with the horses and mules. And the tractor would pull that thing, but it took two people. You remember that picture that was published not too many years ago of your um, relatives up here at Three Point, them heavy boys with that, that old Oliver, one of them driving the tractor and one of them riding the planter? Right. That's the way, that's the way it operated until, well, Quite a bit later, you know, when that when they started making implements to attach. Uh, 
when we go back to that time, most of the farms that people had were somewhere around 80 to 100 acres for the typical farm. Some were bigger, but that was an average farm. And so that family could make a living off of that one farm. That's all you could afford. To, that's all you had time to do with a little one row, <laughs> two meals, <laughs> two, two meals and a one row deal. You couldn't do no more than that. And you depended upon your family to help you accomplish yeah. everything. Everybody worked out there. And then that changed. So if you were a farmer today, how many acres would you need to have in order to make a living? Uh, that's a good question, but I'd say, I'd say roughly 2,000. Okay. Uh, and everything's become so mechani mechanical. Uh, you said there were 24 row. Uh, yeah, see, and now one man gets on that thing with a 24-row planter and he goes out there and plants 500 acres in a day. Everything's and, computerized. Well, it's got, yeah, it's got a monitor in there that tells you that, uh, and that it's all, each, one, each one is working. It's got a, another monitor that guides you down to, with a satellite down through the field on the so the rows are straight and uh, yeah it's uh, that's why it cost two hundred fifty thousand dollars to buy one of them things now okay uh, Susan I'm going to come back to you in high school um, your dad um, did a lot of things yes uh, and uh, one of the things with uh, what were there five children in your six, six children in your family so uh, he knew there weren't a lot of places to eat, and right. so what did he do to provide that opportunity? Well, him and uh, a cousin of ours from uh, Copeland, he had come help him build it, and they built a little A-frame building down um, west of the, the school, what's now Timmerman Elementary School. At the time, it was all 12 grades plus kindergarten when kindergarten started, and uh, he built a little drive-up hamburger joint, hamburgers, milkshakes, soft serve, and not, t not t terribly long after he started it, he added a little dining room to one side and added steaks and fried chicken and a few other things where people could come in. And I don't, th I don't think we could seat over about, maybe not even 30 people in there. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. But him and my mom um, did most of the cooking and work. And except for when we were in school, uh, myself and my two si sisters that were right after me, the other three were pretty young still, waited at the tables, waited on tables, and helped deliver the food and make things. So that was through, I believe I was probably a junior in high school when he started that. And he came up with his menus and how to cook, cook it, and it was a hit. Right, pretty, pretty much a hit. Um, before that, you know, he had, as a, as a means to supplement farming, um, he had tried several other things. Uh, one of them being working in the Pflugerville meat market here, buying it in partnership with uh, a cousin, George Pfluger, and did that for a few years, and then uh, went back to straight farming, I think, in there for a while. When I was very small, before he worked in the meat market, I remember he was gonna sell Edsel cars at one time. He got a job to sell cars with someone over, and I think it was in Round Rock, but I don't think that lasted very long. But uh, yeah, that was our high school it, and I guess it lasted, he probably had, we probably had that for about five or six years until uh, after I left, graduated from high school and went away to school. Then there were two, two more of my sisters that were still in high school and when they both graduated after that and he had to start hiring a lot of help, he didn't keep it open too much longer after that. Plus it wasn't too long after that my grandfather uh, was not able to do as much farm work as he could, had been doing, and there was more farm work for dad to do, so. Did he then sell it to someone? He did, he sold it to someone else, and I'm drawing a blank on who that was, but okay. he did sell it, and it still operated as a drive-in restaurant for quite some time after that. Mm -hmm. 
And it was the only place you could get a malt or a milkshake, milkshake in uh, Pflugerville. Before that time, you had to go to Austin or, or Brown, Brown Rock or Taylor mm -hmm. uh, in order to get that. Right. I don't think even, I, I wonder if even Maynard or Hutto had, uh, I don't, it, 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 was, it was very scarce. Uh, right. I remember as a teenager before that, we'd go to the Dairy Queen and, or Dairy Quinn, whichever it was, over in Round Rock. Mm -hmm. And um, th it did give us a place the young people a place to get something uh, and to hang out and to hang out some yes mm -hmm. okay. um, now he had a nickname shotgun do yes. you know how he got that name I do I, I know the story that I was told he, he got it when he was a very small boy they had some uh, living out in the country with his parents and um, they had someone working on their roof doing something it's the story I was told and that he was up there with the guy and he kept birds would fly over and he'd say if I had a shotgun I could get that bird mm -hmm. and that whoever that person was started calling him shotgun and somehow it it caught on mm -hmm. and he was lot, many people knew him as shotgun not as Leon so you mentioned your grandfather and uh, I'm going to talk about grandfather Fritz right now right uh, you may have been talking about grandfather Edgar uh, that actually that was on their home yes Okay. It was on Edgar Fligger's home that that happened. But. And now that homestead is going to be very close to the new uh, high, high school. school mm -hmm. four. But uh, let's talk about Fritz Fligger. He was uh, the son of George. Right. And George was one of the first uh, immigrants uh, at the age of 14 to come to, from Germany mm -hmm. to Texas. So tell us a little bit about Grandfather Fritz. Well, <laughs> My mother was the only child. Him and his wife had her later in life. And so she was their only child. And um, we lived, when I was born, until I was nine years old, we lived in the old story and a half house that was his home and his wife's home. And then that home was torn down and the brick home that's there now was constructed. And so we lived in that house and then when they tore down and rebuilt. Well, he had a bedroom in our new house, so he, he lived with us, or we lived with him, and we cohabitated. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very close to him, ate every meal with him, and, um, and he was, um, he was, some people thought he was kind of grouchy, but uh, he was never that way to me. Um, we were, uh, he loved his granddaughters, <laughs> for sure, a lot, uh, I think and uh, was very uh, tolerant of our escapades. Uh, but, uh, but going back to him, I was kind of curious, uh, just to get back to German American for just a second with him before some of my other memories. I was also told, and Don might know more about this than me, that I don't think he ever held a, a directorship or anything in German American, but uh, Reuben told me one time that him and his brother Albert Fluger, and there was another one whose name I can't remember, that they were the team of appraisers or guys that went around every five years or so and looked at properties to see if they were being insured properly. So I don't know if that's true or not, if that he ever did that or not, but that's what uh, Reuben had told me. And then interestingly enough, back kind of to my youth, um, in 1966, the company German American was 75 years old. And I remember that anniversary celebration because it was held up at the school. And I was in the band at that time, and the band played as part of the program or while people were eating. I can't remember exactly, as you all probably remember, like at a lot of the firemen's barbecues, the band would play mm -hmm. while people, people were eating. And I remember being at the 75th anniversary of German American and then of course the, by the 100th then I was working for the company and was part of the planning and organization team for that celebration so that's kind of interesting that I can remember for me that much mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. you remember anything before the 75th yeah. no but I got to tell you the, the trademark of Uncle Fritz <laughs> who is my uncle too uh, was his driving everybody uh, you didn't even have to be close you know uh, at that time all the vehicles had clutches mm -hmm. and he stepped on the gas first got <laughs> his motor going nearly full speed before he let the clutch out 
I mean, you could hear him. You knew it's Uncle Fritz coming. And then when he let that clutch out with that motor going that fast, it spun gravel everywhere, <laughs> you know. It, it, you know how them things in low gear. <laughs> but but that was Uncle Fritz, and everybody knew him. Knew you, you, In town, you knew it was Uncle Fritz coming. <laughs> okay, did he have anything to do with First State Bank? Yes, he did. Uh, he was a director. <laughs> that was the thing that I remember uh, most, that he was always a director of the bank. And the bank here in Pflugerville, you know, is quite proud of the fact, or before it was sold, that uh, it was only bank in Travis County that never closed its doors during the Depression for even a day to reorganize. And the story is that him and some other people saw to that not happening with their own funds to make sure the bank could stay open. Again, might be a... A rumor. Yeah. I don't know that. But no, I think that's true. Yeah, and when his uh, when his age kept him from being a director any more than they appointed my mother as a director, I guess based on the fact that she was his only child and she served as director of the bank for a number of years after my grandfather. My grandfather was actually president of the bank of their board of directors during the time, and when I knew it, it was all you know W. E. Fluger and then John came in to work with him later. That they were and the they employees. were they were the employees. It was during their and I don't know who worked for the bank before W. E. That's all I remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he was always uh, every once a month he would, you know, come in. Would, whatever he was doing, they met in the afternoon. Well, that, After lunch, he didn't uh, go back out uh, to the field. He, that bank when it was right up here, that was um, Kemple. Oh, C. C. Yeah. Kemple. C. C. Kemple was a. Uh, he had the, the one. First, that, he was had a desk over there in that little room. Okay. He was uh, he was in charge of that bank. Before W. E. Yeah. Well, before. Well, he was a president. He well, whatever. No, your your dad, well, I think, was president of the board of directors. Yes, he was president of the board of directors. And this, yes. Kemple was the Charlie Kemple, wasn't it? Yeah. He was the. Uh, he he sort of run that bank, I think. I mean, if you wanted a loan, you had to you go. Just see. You well, when to, I was growing up, if you wanted a loan, you had to go see W.E. Fluger. You didn't go see, my grandfather well, didn't work in the bank. He only that, went to the. Before that, you had to go see Charlie Kemple. Because okay. I got my first loan ever for a car from W.E. Fluger way back that? when. And that was a interesting compared to the way you go about getting a loan these days. And I think it was probably for less than a thousand dollars at the time too to buy a used car back in the 60s late 60s so you had to go in the bank and talk to mr Fruder? i did i did i was scared what to death what kind of questions did he ask you you know i don't even remember but, you got the loan. but i got my loan yeah i think i was working uh by then he and was he was one of these guys that uh, did his job the way they told him to do it you had to go interview with him Everybody got a loan. You got to go sit there and visit with him first, and he's going to tell you whether he's going to give it to you or not. Yeah. As I recall, it was probably more like a visit than any kind of uh, actual thinking you were doing business, kind of. But you know, we grew up mm -hmm. right up the street from him. Our house was, at, you know, just less than two blocks from his house, and so I'd seen him growing up all the time in the yard and. I really wasn't scared, scared, but I was, you know, it was different to get my first loan. And I got it without any, I, like I said, it, today it would be like pff, nothing. It was the amount of money, but I think it t probably took me, I probably paid it out at $50 a month for 18 months or something. I don't remember. Um, I think the story you were talking about the bank is true because I heard uh, that it was a uh, farmer state bank and then they closed it one day as that, and the and next day it opened as uh, First State, State Bank. Bank. I think that uh, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Now, uh, Fritz had a, uh, his property was on Gillian Creek that right. ran through the city, or runs through the city of Pflugerville, and had a, uh, what was called a grove, mm -hmm. which was main, meant it was a tree-covered bottom that was attractive, and a lot of things happened in that grove. Tell me a little bit about your recollections of yeah. the Growth. Yeah, my earliest memories of anything there was with the church, the Manual Lutheran Church. The, we had a church picnic. We called it the Sunday School Picnic then um, every year that was there and a couple of family reunions that uh, I attended. 
and, and there were some other groups that used it too. Uh, there was, I remember there being kind of a homemade concession stand or serving table thing between some trees, kind of L-shaped maybe or U-shaped that sometimes as kids we would play on down there because it wasn't taken down from one event to the next. I remember that uh, usually those events were like June and July and that the men that were on the committees for the events would meet and kind of clean up and mow grass and spread some uh, sulfur around to hope, hopefully control some of the chiggers. Um, and I remember having a lot of fun. We always played in the creek. We always waited. By the time, um, I mean, there was a pretty good swimming hole there. I know during the time my mother was a child or a girl and teenager, but just silt and things. By the time I came along, it was probably only about three feet deep. You couldn't do any real diving, but we played in there in that area too. That was long before any um, sewer no, you, systems recycled through our creeks like they do now. The way that thing worked, the, there was a committee at the church, you know, it's church picnic, manual church picnic, and the, the, uh, usually it was a week before the Fluger reunion. So those two, two committees got together to come down there and clean the park. You know, it was cattle in there. Mm-hmm. And you had to, and, and the limbs all down, you know, you had to clean out the cow piles, cow patties, <laughs> and uh, make it where you could use it. But I guarantee you, Uncle Fritz was always down there. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he was. <laughs> Watching to see what you he, did. Yeah. He told you what you could do and you couldn't Indeed. do. <laughs> well, I remember, too, about him um, and the mm. park, you know, well, or the, we call it the park now but the uh, grove, but kind of different things. I remember him coming to town almost every afternoon for a little while and going to one of the taverns. He didn't drink beer, um, but he'd have a Dr. Pepper or something and he'd play dominoes with some of the other guys. And uh, he, he wasn't much of a beer drinker, but he did believe in the medicinal use of, uh, of uh, now I forgot the name. What did he, it was a uh, Sigram Seven. Seagram Seven, he believed in the in toddies and the medicinal use of a, a shot here and there to get yourself going in the morning or if you had a cold to calm the cough in the evening. And he kept it in the bottom of his closet. He kept it, and I remember that. How long did he, how, what was his age at death? Uh, he was 90, let's see, what did I say? He was born in... Pretty old. Yeah, he was born in 1891, and he died in... Um, 1971, so he was uh, almost 90, yeah. 92, I think. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I was gonna tell you too when y'all were talking about the mules a while ago that even, you know, I'm not that far behind you in age, but he kept a mule even after the tractors were in use. He kept a mule and he would plow our garden every year with that, he'd hitch that mule and put the, I don't know, the reins or whatever you call it, around his shoulders, and he still plowed that garden when I was old enough to remember well that that's how he pl took care of our garden every year and prepared it for the planting. So he might have given it up in the field, but he still thought he needed to do that in the garden. Uh, one of the things I remember about the Sunday school picnic and I think the 4th of July is they always, people, the Fluggers like to sing, or the people yeah. in Fluggerville like to sing, so they wanted a piano in mm. the park and they would have to load the piano up uh, at the church. Okay, Don, you want to tell that story? No, you're doing fine. <laughs> uh, and it was the group of men and uh, if they didn't drive carefully and in one year they didn't and uh, the piano fell off the truck. Uh -huh. And then they would bring all the chairs down also. Right. That was the end of that piano. Yeah. I'm a, I don't remember that one, but. Yeah, it fell off. Right there at W.E.'s house. <laughs> uh, Fritz's wife, um, she died at a very young age. Uh, well, yes, she died. I don't really know what age she was exactly, but my mother was only nine years old. But I believe she was into her 40s. I think she was born, they'd been married almost 25 years before she was born, as I recall, reading in the Fligger book. But yeah, she died of pneumonia. And uh, so my grandfather, raised his daughter pretty much most of the time with the help of uh, other 
family members. Um, I'm going to go back to when you were in high school, Susan. A tradition in the community was to have a May fate. Uh, so tell us about your experience with okay. May Well, uh, in, in the year I was a senior in high school, it was a leap year. And at the Richland May fate, every leap year, they chose a king instead of a queen. And that year, at that time, I was, uh, had begun dating. My, at the end of my junior year, dating Ron. Molenberg, who I ended up marrying, and I'm still married to, and uh, none of the other boys out in that area wanted to be king, and so uh, your mother, Verna Hebby, somehow came and got they got Ron, and he he was kind of a he was a good student, fairly well known in in the community, even though he hadn't been here as many years, and for some reason he admit, said yes, so I got to be queen by default, I suppose that year, our senior year of high school. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, I participated, I guess, when I was a young child in a Tiny Tots court. And I believe it was at the Dessal May Fate, though. As I, I, I've been told that, I don't recall that. But uh, the Richland May Fate, I think that was the first year I ever, part first year I ever participated, maybe. Maybe the second year was, maybe I, we'd been in it once before. but. Um, that was a quite interesting experience and it was fun. Um, and we'd meet out there in practice with uh, mostly Miss Wittenberg running, Selma Wittenberg keeping us in line and telling everybody how to do it and what to do it and when to do it. And did the parade with the, um, the grand, march. Uh, grand March and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't do a Maypole then that year. And I don't think they did the next year either, but. Um, so at the dance, uh, do you remember who played for the dance and what were some of the dances that you did? Well, I don't remember who played for that dance. I honestly do not that year. I wonder if it wasn't Fritz Hottie, mm -hmm. but because I think he was pretty popular back then and did it pretty often, so I'm guessing that's who it was. It, um, the dances we danced at the, the prom and our sock hops at high school, we danced to the Beatles songs, Hermits, Hermans, Hermits. Uh, mostly it was uh, pr a precursor to rock and, you know, the rock and roll type music, but in a very mild, <laughs> in a mild way compared to what eventually involved, evolved a few years. It certainly wasn't hard rock, a little bit of slow dancing. Uh, me and my friends, we weren't into country music yet at that time. Country music was still what our grandparents listened to. Polkas, pretty much the same thing. Not many kids were interested in, in my time, anybody that I was around wasn't too interested in doing anything like polkas and waltzes. It was just either a slow dance where you just had to move a little bit, <laughs> hold on to each other, or a little bit of a, a, a different version of, uh, um, oh, the twist. The twist became popular during that time. And we all liked doing that. Okay, so Don, you were also in a May fate over at Dessau Hall. Uh, you were king. Uh, what was Dessau Hall like? Well, I, you know, I don't know much about that. Uh, the the uh, Richland May fate was the big one, and Dessau decided they wanted to do one, I think, because they didn't do many. But they picked Gladys as my girlfriend as the <laughs> queen. So, yeah, I got to be king. I think Dessau's was all inside. It, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Where it was. was uh, outside. Outside, and, mostly. Uh, really a very community-oriented uh, mm -hmm. uh, event. Maybe the Dessau yeah. one I was in was even the year that, of that. Uh, I don't know what I year that would have been. Tiny tot. I've seen yeah, that see. And then, of course, I'm older, older, I'm enough older than you. We didn't get into that stuff you're talking about. That was, that was Elvis Presley's days. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's a whole different deal than <laughs> what she's talking about. Yeah. And I was when we were growing up. That was Elvis, you know, number one. Okay, you graduated in 1955. Uh, and when I was at Flickerville High School, I came to school one day and there was a 55 painted on the gym roof. Is there a story behind that? 
<coughs> no, other than not hooted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, boys were known for doing pranks uh, over the ages, and uh, somehow somebody crawled on the roof, right? <coughs> yeah, well you, well, you had to get up there. Mm -hmm. We had a, well, it was, that was no, that roof is flat. You know, there was no danger. I don't know how we got up there. I don't know. You had you had to have a ladder, but I have no idea where the ladder come. But there was a ladder and a bucket of paint and a brush, and there was more than me up there. But we we paint. Yeah, we painted it up there. Seniors fifty five, and that dang the next year, them guys come up there and they turned that last five into a six. Oh, and. It only lasted one year. <laughs> uh, you played football uh, for Pflugerville High School. Uh, tell us about your team and what kind of football you played. Well, of course, that was in the days of six man, and uh, and I was happened to be up there at the time of Gene Galt, which uh, I don't know, I don't know how I'll refer to him. <laughs> I mean, he was several years ahead of me, but he was the—he was quite a player. You know, we won—we won a lot of football games. Uh, but it was him that uh, was caused that to happen. Who were some of the teams uh, that you played? Well, you know, I mean, there was everybody around here except. Round Rock, you know, Round Rock was always a little bigger than us, and of course we didn't play Austin, but you play everybody else. Okay. Um, Six-man football, what were some of your scores like? Huh. Well, you know, with six people out there, you it's a high-scoring game. Uh, it was always like uh, 60 or 70 to... 40 or something like that. Were there any close games? A few. <laughs> Who was your biggest rival? Hutto. Okay. And uh, what about that game? Well, we won that game <coughs> by one point, and I kicked the darn field goal. I mean, an extra point to win it. And they put an article in the paper. <coughs> Calling me Diamond Toe after that, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> I I did make that extra point and won that game. Now Huddle's football field was a little different than foot, uh, Pflugerville's football a field. It was kind of down in the bottom, uh, well, and it was a, a lower place. Sometimes it would be uh, maybe it wasn't in the years you played, but it could get a little muddy. Well, yeah, it was in the, it was the, the creek, you know, the creek went underneath the uh, bleachers. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it, and the crazy thing about that is I ended up buying that property and I owned that uh, next to the football field and the baseball field. <clears throat> and then one day they came over uh, they were gonna. They wanted to redo the, make the baseball field just a little bit further, a little longer, out in center field. And so I told him, I said, well, I'll just give you that. I'll just give you that little strip. But uh, what happened when they went to to the records, at the deeds and stuff, I owned half of the football field and they owned. Half of my pasture. The, there was a. They didn't get that straight. So we had to go and rewrite all them deeds to get them. The, but I, I, that football field was mine. <laughs> <laughs> the one no, that you played on. Huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you remember playing in Kerrville against Harper? I remember playing in Kerrville. Yes. Uh, Maybe it was center point. That's the one. I got injured up there one time. That's the only thing I remember about that. <laughs> what kind of injury? 
injury was it? Oh, I don't know, not, nothing major. Uh, okay. That's when I remember your 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 mom would come out there over. I was sitting on the bench, and she come out and checked on me. You know, my parents didn't go, and uh, but I was all right. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, you eventually, uh, then years later, served on the school board. How many years did you serve as a trustee for the Pflugerville Independent School District? <clears throat> I served 19 years up there. So you saw a lot of change. Tell us about, uh, I we, guess, we saw all the growth, uh, you know. They they had just built this uh, El Pflugerville Elementary over here by the church, and then they built that high school, and uh, I think they had just moved into it a year or two when I got on the board, and everything else that was built, we, we built schools every year and uh, if you go look at those plaques you're going to find my name on a lot of them. <laughs> uh, one of the things that was always a challenge uh, being a trustee was uh, how much money you were going to have and how it was spent. Uh, so, And you were fairly conservative so what were some of the things that you did uh, like with school buildings you, you kind of did similar designs? Well, <clears throat> you know, that that sort of was the, uh, when I first got up there, and I forget that guy's name now, but they hired, or we hired this guy, Penrose. Penrose, was, he was not, he was not really qualified to, do all that but but that was mainly the remodel you know that the original Fleurville High School up there has been added on to at least three times maybe four I mean it was not it was one building and then we added we added another the it, it's all hidden from the front but if you if you get up there and look at that thing, it's all different buildings uh, hooked together. Uh, and Penrose is the one that was responsible for that. But then av after that, we had to get a we hired architect, an architect firm, and and uh, you know that took care of that whole deal. Uh, the football field that was built up. Uh uh, on Pecan Street at the present Pflugerville High School was a little bit of a different design stadium. Tell us about how that came, uh, the idea and how it happened. Well, you know, that, that actually happened before I was up there. And I don't know a lot about it other than it seemed like they had seen one, the story I heard, they saw one built like that somewhere. Maybe you know. And they decided that was a good, good uh, way to do it, and that's how how it got. Uh, it, yeah, it's a bit. They piled up the dirt <laughs> and set that bleachers right in the dirt. Uh, it didn't have to do no framework, but I don't really know. Uh, that was before I was there. Yeah. Uh, Susan. Uh you grew up in Pflugerville. What were some of the businesses uh, over your time from a little girl to present that you remember visiting uh, in downtown Pflugerville? Well, the, the drugstore, Mr. Nazy's drugstore, and where we could get, first time I, I had anything, uh, we'd get there for ice cream. You know, we'd get a, a, get to get an ice cream cone there, and I remember when, when it suddenly wasn't just vanilla, we had got chocolate revel <laughs> and Superior Dairy's ice cream. Uh, and that was always neat. Um, Mr. Stricker's uh, dry goods and grocery store that I uh, remembered. I was just fascinated by that store because, you know, it was two sides. And one side was the dry goods. And uh, my Aunt Selma, and I don't know who'd before her, but she was the one that worked there that I remembered. And then Mr. Stricker had the grocery side. And mostly I remember Adolph Becker working for him too in there. And uh, we'd buy our groceries there 
and uh, we took eggs too. Sometimes we took eggs in. I uh, remember that uh, when I was pretty small. But, uh, and they'd run a tab and then once a month pay the grocery bill. And then Mr. Stricker's old black, whatever that car was, I don't know what model, it was an old thing. He'd come puttering up the street and he'd bring a little treat to us kids. <laughs> he'd come and he, we, he'd have a little bag where each one of us with little treats in it after the bill was paid. Uh, or periodically, I'm not sure it was every time, but periodically, a couple of several times a year anyways. Uh, so I remember that store. Um, I remember when Knable's Tavern or Tufts was on Main Street here, and then when it moved over to what, what's in there now? A Yates? Is, it, w it was Yates Lawnmower, but I'm not sure if there's anything in that particular section. And then, of course, it moved across the street later. So I remember those three locations. Um, my dad was a patron, and uh, uh, we, we got to spend some time playing on the beer boxes in the back sometimes with, with Tuff's daughter, Jan, and uh, Mr. Fowler and some of the other men. Mr. Fowler was the cotton buyer, cotton something for the gin, and he mm -hmm. would always give us a nickel, and for a nickel we could get a Dixie cup and a soda water or something, and, or, or maybe one or the other, I don't remember. Um, and some of the men hanging around town. The, Fligger, the meat market, as the Fligger market, um, of course, was in the 60s, I believe. Um, I don't remember much about the other stores. I remember the bank being down here in the corner. And um, I remember the fire, the year in 71, uh, when the buildings burned down. Um, and we were uh, early on the scene of that. Uh, Ron and I had gotten married in, in May of that year and we were living in a trailer house down where the Methodist Church is now and we saw the smoke. Ron and his brother were out working on a car um, and we saw the smoke into town and came running this way so I remember being up all night and um, some of that with that with these buildings burning. Uh, I just don't remember many of the other uh, buildings as businesses. So you had a trailer house by the gin. Right, yes, right, right so, wait, west of the gin. Were they still ginning cotton at Oh, that yes. Time? And so what was it like living there during uh, the ginning season? <laughs> well, and we weren't there very long. Uh, let me just say that. We were only there uh, for uh, a little over a year. Um, and I, it was, you know, I just remember not being that much different than what it was living in the house we lived in up here on Walnut Street and how our window screens would be covered with lint, you know, all through that, that season because they didn't have all the um, filters and controls and that later came into being. Um, as I remember in 71 though, some of that had started happening and it wasn't as bad as it had been earlier. Uh, they put but on some kind of filter. filters, filtration systems and such. But um, I, I mean, I feel like I've seen a lot of change. You know, when I was a teenager, sometimes we would sit on the porch in front of Tufts Tavern on Sunday evenings or maybe Saturday nights after it was closed. But nobody wanted to go home. It might just be 1030 and nobody wanted to go home yet. And we'd just sit out there on the porch and talk. You know, and watch, the cars and watch how much car, many cars. Were well, I, that was kind of funny <laughs> because I remember a time when somebody, and I can't remember who it was, went to lay on the middle of the street to see how long they could lay there before a car came. And I think <laughs> they finally got up because they were tired of laying there in the middle of the street. <laughs> somebody of my error, probably of a couple of years older than me, I don't remember who it was at the time, but uh, yeah, there weren't many cars coming by. There wasn't much, there wasn't much of a drag in Pflugerville to drive up and down and see where anybody was. Um, uh, so yeah. Don, what do you remember about the, the, the gin yard? You, you were bringing cotton in and it would get very crowded and... Uh, yeah, it was a busy place. Uh, it did what it's supposed to do, gin cotton. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you ever work at the gin? You just were at no, the I, bringing it in? No, I had to work. I worked hard enough filling them trailers. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I let them take care of it after I got it up here. Okay. No, I was going to say it. You know, Strickers. See, we used to. Of course, see, I'm 
what am I, 15, 20 years yeah, ahead of you? I don't know that you're that far <laughs> ahead of me, but. <laughs> but. But we came on Saturday, at, at, on every Saturday, then, then people out in the country came up here to town. That was, oh, you didn't do nothing out there on Saturday. Because Mama had butter, butter and eggs. You know, and she had to come bring, she brought that up here to Stricker's. Stricker bought it. And then we, uh, she bought groceries, you know, used all that money plus whatever. I, I don't know. But then, see, the men, the Tufts was, well, it wasn't Tufts. It was PBK's. PBK, yeah. Next door. All the men went next door. Well, the women was buying groceries. They was over there, and Daddy would take us in there to Knable's, and we we drank Pepsi every time we'd come in the door. And you know that was Tough was there at that time, but his dad was the main man in there yet then, and he'd, he'd get us out of Pepsi. <clears throat> And is that all they had in PBKs was just drinks, or did they they didn't have anything else to sell? They played dominoes. Well, I don't I don't remember much dominoes. They probably was some. What they sold, <laughs> I probably shouldn't talk about. But they had this little jar. It was a kind of square jar, and it was full of little tickets. They called them tickets. And they was kept in behind it, under the bar. And those guys would buy them little tickets. I mean, a lot of them, they, you could win. You could win something. Some of those guys bought uh, uh, quite a few of them. Kind of like a lottery? Yeah, it was some kind of, it was, I, I'm pretty sure it was illegal. <coughs> but. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't keep them under the under the bar if it was, but I noticed that, you know, what them guys keep buying them little papers out of that jar. Uh, I remember Becker's too, Becker's filling station. We, that's where yeah. we could get crushed ice. Those big yeah. blocks of ice, and they'd set them in there and crush them before you yeah. before you'd go into a. Circle K yeah. or a quick stop and buy a bag of crushed ice. See, I was going to mention oh, this lumber yard here. Oh. The, you know, that to me, he, he was he was an important business. Well, he helped me out tremendously. That's when we got married and we didn't have no place to live, so we decided to fix up that little old hand house down there. And I came up here and talked to old Rip and... He said, uh, he, he financed me. He said, I'll finance you. You just go ahead and come get what you want and we'll put it on a tip bill and then you can just pay it off by the month, which we did. I mean, it was, uh, That's true. I mean, it got me going. I remember that too, uh, Kimple Lumberyard and being in uh, there many times. I don't and remember. Then the, and then the other thing that I was, it was Marshall's uh -huh. grocery store over there yeah. on the main, on 685, you know, Marshall's helped us. He helped, they helped me tremendously with groceries. Uh, you didn't have to come in there and pay for groceries every dang time you bought them. They'd, like you just run a, run you a just, ticket. They, you had a little book. They'd write it down in the book for you. And, uh, you come pay whenever you wanted to pay, when you could pay. Yeah, I don't remember. Were they open? At, did they open before Mr. Stricker's closed, or was it after that, the Stricker's uh, store, or maybe yeah, kind of I concurrently don't, I toward don't the know. end? It might have been after. And I believe they opened after. Yeah. Uh, of course, there was uh, dawn offers down there, but we never did. Uh, we never did go down there much. Okay, uh, so uh, the the church. What what? Uh, any recollections of Emmanuel Lutheran? Oh yeah. Well, that was uh, if it if it 
if in my time, if it, what we did didn't evolve around the school, it evolved around Emmanuel Lutheran for the better part of most of the kids. Half the kids in my class, when I graduated from high school with 20 graduate, other 19 graduates besides myself, we were pretty we were a pretty small class and pretty small group of kids, and about half of us were members of Emmanuel, and. Um, you know, after the football games, there were some social activities some, for a few years back in the 60s. They'd, uh, we could hang out up at the old uh, Luther League Hall before it was torn down. And some parents would fix refreshments and there were a couple of, I don't remember who our sponsors were that stayed there with us, but it gave us a place to go after a football game since there were no other. Uh, you know, like I said, later, later on in the latter part of my high school years, well, my dad had put in that uh, hamburger joint, but early years there there was nothing to do, and kids always wanted to hang out and talk about something. So we did that, um, and I liked that old hall. You know, was neat, and uh, we do our midnight. You know, a party every on, every year on uh, New Year's Eve, a midnight New Year's Eve party where we'd stay up till midnight and ring the church bell when it turned to the new year. And that was always a popular thing to do. So did you have a church service then at that time? No, you you just had we were just partying, party. yes. <laughs> we didn't play board games. And probably board time. games and volleyball and bunco. Bunco was a big uh, a activity we did. did Went on hay rides at least one, once or twice a year. Was, that was always a popular event that a lot of, you know, we'd get, we'd get kids from other churches and other friends that didn't go to Emmanuel would always participate in that too, so... Um, you know, we just didn't, uh, didn't roam too far from Pflugerville, especially when, if you were younger, you know, like your younger high school years, you know, junior high, which was seventh and eighth grade, and then ninth and 10th grade, uh, you know, unless you had an older brother or sister that was willing to put up with a younger sibling, and I didn't, I was the oldest, so I never had anybody that kind of ever gave me a ride anywhere, so, you know, we had to do things within the town, and of course, it was safe to walk all over, you know, or ride our bicycles all over. And now you almost can't let an 11-year-old out of your sight without fear that they'll, you know, to go a few blocks. But we roamed this town back in the 60s uh, from one of my best friends lived over by the church. And we'd walk back and forth. And mm -hmm. it was just a, a lot more relaxed. And, and, you know, you couldn't get away with much because... Even if your parents were on the opposite side of town, there was somebody that's going to see you doing something. If you were doing something wrong most of the time. And likewise with teachers, it, they knew yeah, who your parents were. That's right. It seemed like when uh, new people would move to town, again, they came with the schools and their kids would come to the church because that's how they would meet right. the other students in the class. It them. was a very important part still in the 60s when I was uh, growing up. Mm -hmm. And I know it was for several years in the 50s mm -hmm. uh, too, but it, it continued on into the 60s. I don't, think, I don't think activities changed a whole lot around Pflugerville until into the 70s maybe when yeah. the real big growth hit, <coughs> you know, when the growth started and the classes started being, being 100 kids in a class over 20 or 30 and uh, your dad served in World War One. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what you know about his service. Well, I don't know a lot, you know, uh, other than, yeah, he was in, in World War I and he, he, he ended up in France. And uh, I know he talked about uh, building a telegraph line that's what his his company or whatever they put up poles and strung wire. I don't know where they were. were I guess for the uh, people out in the head of them, so they could signal back. I guess that they didn't have didn't have radio then. I guess I don't know. So do you remember uh, when you first had a telephone in your home? We always had a phone. I don't know, I don't know why, but we did, we always had a phone. And what was it like at the beginning when you could talk on the phone? How, how would you call somebody? Well, you had a central office right up here in town and 
do you ring the uh, operator and uh, she would connect those. Of course, I knew the people that were running that thing. You, they had little cards, a bunch of cards, and they'd plug them in. Whoever, however that worked, they connected you up here to who you wanted. It wasn't automatic. It was a pl manual. Manual plugs. And they had to know everybody's phone number, who you were, and who it was going to. Yeah, and it, and then there was all party lines out there, you know, and so your, your, uh, it rang more. It didn't just ring with for you. It rang for your neighbors too. Uh, most of them had three, so you, you had to know. It rang a, a long and a short, or two longs, or whatever. It was a combinations of that. Yeah, and one of them was be yours. But Mama listened in on everybody. Every time it rang, she and she listened on everyone. <laughs> so that's how you found out what was, was going, going on. on. <laughs> yeah. She did. So who was uh, on the party line at that time? The Beckers and the Randicks and A. Wolfweiss. Uh, no, Aunt Marie. <laughs> Aunt, Aunt Marie was always on there, and uh, I don't even know who the other one was. But I told Gladys, "We're not going to buy a phone. We're not going to put in a phone in my house just until we can get one that will ring at our house and not at Grandma's house, <laughs> because she's going to know. She's going to listen to every time." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, the first house you lived in uh, was actually, was it part of a school out there once upon a time? Yeah. What school was that? Center Point. Okay. That's when you had uh, community schools uh, all around Pflugerville. There were about six. It was, actually, it was not the original. Well, it was the original. See, they had rebuilt that school. And this was the first one. And I guess Mr. Weiss bought it, Grandpa Weiss bought it and moved it up there. Mm -hmm. And they built an, another one down there, newer one. And that's the one then they moved it up here for the, that was the homemaking building or the band hall on the uh, uh, original campus up here, back here between the school and the football field. That was the old Center Point School that they moved. I remember them moving it. They moved through the, they moved through our pro, our property down there, and came up Fluger Lane. Uh, they had a little old dozer, and when they got down there to the creek, he flattened out that bank on the creek, and pulled it right on through there. Was I remember. With the truck or, or with the uh, horses? Hmm. No, it had that little tractor pulled it, and it, but it was on the wheels. The wheels they used were wood. Uh, Susan, uh, your husband uh, eventually became fire chief uh, of the uh, volunteer fire department and then of the ESD. And we know that uh, firefighters need a lot of support beyond just their required job. So what are some of the things that you do, have done to support? Volunteerism is a, a big thing in the community. Yes, Portugal. yes it is. And I did, uh, I did my share, I think, in the early years of the department when it was all volunteer. And then later on, uh, I remember my mother and the ladies, when my dad was one of the charter members of the fire department, and they for the fireman's barbecue, well, the women would make the potato salad and they'd all gather at one or the other ladies' houses and make the potato salad for the meal. And then, you know, later on, as, after Ron became involved, um, we did that too. I helped make potato salad for that first, when it was still just one annual big fundraiser. Then as uh, gasoline, as there get, got to be more people in the area and they, there were more calls and as such, uh, and this was back as a volunteer still, uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s, we'd have bake sales and we had a garage sale and things like that to try to help raise money to fund the fire department. 
as well as the fact that they uh, did an associate membership drive every year in the fall, and I don't remember if it was $10 or $20 or $25. It started out pretty low, I think. I know I helped, I helped I.B. Crinky one year type those associate member cards and that mailing when I was in, a teenager to send out, and I believe at that time it was probably $10 a person. If they donated $10, uh, and that went into a fund and they were called associate members and they got a little membership card. Um, so anyways, yes, I helped with those kind of activities and then as the department in the area grew, it was more and more and then uh, during the years when Flugger Hall was being built and then we worked uh, in those early years, the fire department catered a lot of the events that were there, sometimes two or three a month and we would uh, cook the food and serve the food and clean up the place and help with that uh, as fundraisers. Then on the other side, just as support, um, one year, for instance, Ron was uh, hurt on the way to a call. Uh, he, a fire truck rolled over, he was driving it, and uh, went to the hospital, and the friend that was with him and the, got a ride back to our house to tell me that my husband had gone to the hospital. Nobody else from the fire department contacted me, so we kind of decided to try to, you know, that should never happen to someone, that there should be someone that could be called. And so uh, fortunately that we didn't have much need for that, but we did, I did help kind of organize that, you know, too, to, so that if there was ever a need, someone would go to that house and take care of that woman's children if the husband had to go to the department. That was just within the department. Um, I started after my kids were old enough to be left at home at night if there was a call in the middle of the night I often uh, went to the fire scene as well to um, fill water cups for the guys and help with rehab uh, the firefighters when it was a long event or um, and uh, or if they were going to be on the scene for a long time I made sandwiches or I went and you know after some more businesses started being around here I often went and purchased something, but a lot of times I went to a, to a store and bought bread and meat and made sandwiches and had one or two other people that helped me with that too, but did a lot of that in the early days uh, to try to keep things, you know, to help out. There was no real fire ex auxiliary, auxiliary here and Ron always uh, hated to call Salvation Army when they need it for something. He always felt like that should be for the people who were victims, not the people who were working. And um, so, yeah, I did a lot of that kind of stuff, too. Uh, whenever we'd have somebody moved in the community and joined the fire department, a young family or young man, sometimes single people, didn't know very many people, we, you know, Ron took a lot of those folks under the wing, and we often um, made sure they met other people or uh, fed them a meal or, you know, tried to make them feel welcome in the community on a different level than uh, most people ever knew about. So. It, that's pretty much it. You know, I did it for fundraising and for support. support. Um, and you and, have a son now that is And on. I do, who also um, was so, he helped so much when he was a younger guy too, and he would spend a lot of time. And I, I wasn't surprised when the, our oldest son wanted to be a firefighter because uh, he could used to could tell when we lived up here on Walnut Street when a fire truck, when, when they got more than one truck, he could tell by listening to him which truck it was that was going up the road. <laughs> and he was always right. Mm. <laughs> but at any rate, yeah, we've been involved. Uh, I feel like I've been involved because my dad was a charter member. By the time Ron joined the department in 1977 as a volunteer, my dad had become an inactive member, but I think he was still on the rolls as a, you know, he paid his dues but didn't do much. Now your mom and dad also donated Flugger Park? They The original part of Flugger Park. Mm -hmm. They donated to the city back in 1975. Um, they had sold some the land across the creek that was that's Brook Hollow. I believe that was be, when they did that and um, they felt like it needed to stay. You know, it had been a kind of a picnic area and it needed to stay that way. And so they donated the land for the original park. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Let me tell you about, oh, I wanted to mention Ivy Crinky. She said, Ivy, yeah. I don't know how much you got. You probably got all you need on him. 
<laughs> but but IB was our, you know, he sold insurance with um, uh, Luther Mutual. Mutual. And um, he was, I say, an excellent insurance agent. You know, he carried, he, came, he did all of our family out there. You know, and, and what he did, he, every time you had a new birth in the family, he'd come write a policy. He, he made it a point to, he kept up with that. And, and then we got married and when we had kids, here he come. <laughs> Wrote them policies for them kids, the little babies, you know, for everyone. And then he came one day and he wanted to write me a, I said, I needed an IRA. You, you ought to get you an IRA. But he did a, he, to me he was an excellent uh, insurance man. I don't know if anybody, surely somebody else knew that. Well, he was but just an overall wonderful individual, too, he, besides that. Uh, you know, my living right around the corner from them, too, and his wife, Pearl Crinky, was one of my godmothers, was a baptismal sponsor for me, so I always felt close. And we, <coughs> me and my sisters, we go over there and visit with them all the time, and they always stopped and had time for us to put up oh, with yeah. our... Very, uh, you know, they didn't ever say, we're too busy, you run on and play, or something like very that. Very friendly fella. And uh, both him and his wife, and just made you feel important. Plus, then he gave up so much of his time at the beginning of the start of the city as mayor to try to, I think he, I think he gave a lot to this city that, I don't know who else would have done as much as he did. Well, yeah, and he was for nearly 10 or 12 years as mayor he and W.E. and Tuff, Tuff uh -huh. you know, but he was the mayor, so he had a lot of A lot of responsibility in that. Uh, so, uh, in final uh, question would be, um, what do you see in two mm -hmm. to five to ten years for this community, for this city? <laughs> Continuing growth, I think, you know. I think that... Uh, the town that I knew and grew up in has long been gone. I mean, there's still a core group of people that I can remember that were influential in my life that are still living, but a lot of those people have gone on. And it's very, um, very often, uh, my husband and I eat out lunch almost every day at various businesses in the area. And there's many businesses we go into to eat lunch that we never see anybody we know at lunchtime. And that wouldn't have happened. Well, of course, there wouldn't have been that many places to go to to choose from, <laughs> but that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago even. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's just going to, you know. Yeah, I think it's it, it, it's going to go. There's no stopping it now. Uh, uh, you know, the, and I saw in there somewhere in one of them questions about what I thought about it. Well, you know, to me, they put me out of business. You know, they didn't consider agriculture. I mean, 